me here this evening. I am Patrick Loza, the chief of the HIV, STD, and hepatitis branch of public health services in the County of San Diego's Health and Human Services Agency. Welcome. As a housekeeping note, we are recording this event so that people who don't have a who don't have time to attend tonight can still receive the very important information we hope to provide. If you do not wish to be recorded, we ask that you please log off now. The recording for this event will be posted to the county's website and we will put a link in the chat box. We are just a little more than two weeks away from our amazing San Diego LGBTQ Pride celebration. Uh, and I don't know about y'all, but this pride feels very important to me. Over five decades ago, our queer family had enough and fought back against oppression. We rose up on June 28, 1969 and demanded our right to love the people whom we loved without hiding, without fear of being jailed or losing our jobs or our freedom. We fought to show pride in ourselves and our communities. Being proud became one of our primary acts of defiance and we continue to show our pride. On Pride Weekend and at our Pride Parade, we get to show our numbers and strength and diversity and our joy and our love for each other. It's been a hard couple of years and we need this. And our queer family across the United States, they need to see this too. We know too that we have some new concerns working their way through our communities of gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. One is called monkeypox, and it is a legitimate cause of concern. We are here tonight to tell you what we know and tell you how you can protect yourselves and your communities. We will also be talking to you tonight about something called invasive meningococcal disease, as we have seen a large outbreak among gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men in Florida. We want you to know what it is and what you can do to protect yourselves and your communities and still have an amazing pride. After two brief presentations, there will be a panel who will do their best to answer any questions you might have. There is a Q&A button on your screen and we ask that you type your questions there and, uh, and not in the chat box. Uh, our first speaker tonight is Dr. Ankita Kadakia. Dr. Kadakia is a public health services deputy health officer in the Health and Human Services Agency. She is board certified in internal medicine and infectious disease. She previously served as the branch chief and medical director for the county tuberculosis control and refugee health program. Prior to joining the county, Dr. Kadakia worked at the University of California, San Diego as an assistant professor of medicine and practiced at the UCSD Owen Clinic. She also created the first transgender healthcare symposium. She enjoys spending time with her family as well as practicing and teaching Keeley meditation when she is not working. Welcome, Dr. Kadakia, and I will pass it off to you. Thank you so much, Patrick, and thank you for those wonderful world, words of inspiration and that very kind introduction. I'm really excited to be here with all of you this evening um, to talk about monkeypox. I just want to preface by saying um, this is a lecture that was prepared for our, the community, um, but also if there are any questions, I see some healthcare workers um, in our participants, you know, we're happy to answer those in the Q&A as well. Um, so again, we're going to be talking about prepping for pride and what you need to know about monkeypox. Next slide, please. So as you may have heard of, there is a, a monkeypox outbreak currently globally, and this is just a map of the countries where there are monkeypox cases reported. There are over 5,000 cases currently, um, with the majority of that concentration of cases being in Europe, um, but 51 different locations, as well as here in the United States um, and in Mexico. Next slide, please. In the US, the states that are colored in blue are states that are reporting cases so far. We have a total of 351 cases reported across the United States, with 80 of those being in California and four in San Diego County. Next slide, please. 
I want to just review with you uh, signs and symptoms of monkeypox. What we really want for the purpose of this talk is for you to go out and celebrate your community and enjoy pride, but take some precautionary steps and keep your eyes open for signs and symptoms of monkeypox so that we can get you into care as quickly as possible. Monkeypox, I want to reiterate, is a really rare disease. It is caused by a virus um, called monkeypox and belongs to an orthopox virus genus. This is the same um, family of viruses as smallpox or cowpox. And the um, pox viruses have a particular rash that I'm going to show you. Some people develop symptoms prior to developing this rash. They could have fever, swollen glands, chills, headache, body aches, or muscle aches, similar to um, having a flu-like um, syndrome. Next slide, please. Monkeypox, usually the rash will occur on the face or um, in, inside the mouth, um, what we call mucosal membranes, um, and then can make its way down to the hands and feet or palms and soles and then spread to the trunk or belly area. What we've been seeing and what's been reported um, in some of the cases that have been reported um, have been that the monkeypox virus uh, the rash has started in the genital area. And so this of course is um, a concern because it can be confused with other rashes that can look similar. So I put some pictures of other rashes that may look similar to monkeypox, but for you to be aware of that if you develop a rash that doesn't seem typical of um, something that you've had before or it seems unusual, um, any rash really, um, we wanna make sure to have you go get checked out with your healthcare provider. So these rashes, um, the rash of monkeypox is usually a raised, um, well um, circular uh, lesion, like a bump, basically. Um, and I'm going to show you different variations in the next slide. But it can, um, there have been cases reported um, with other infectious diseases. So monkeypox and syphilis has been reported, monkeypox and varicella zoster, um, or um, chickenpox or herpes zoster um, have also been reported. Um, some cases have been seen in um, STD clinics, and so it's also really important that if you are, um, uh, if you were attending an STD clinic and you have a concern of a rash, to please let your provider know so that they can um, uh, um, test, um, test you for any infections. Next slide, please. So these are some pictures of um, some early stages of uh, monkeypox rashes. Again, it can look like small pimples. Um, the central portion can look a little um, uh, what we call umbilicated or the center being a little deflated with the edges um, or surrounding it raised. Um, it can look like a sore. Um, so there's different variations. So again, if you notice an a, um, a rash or a lesion or a pimple um, that seems unusual to you, it's important to go get checked out. Next slide, please. So monkeypox transmission, usually the um, symptoms from time, from time from infection to developing symptoms from monkeypox is between seven to 14 days, but we are seeing even between five to 21 days. So all the way out to 21 days from being exposed or developing symptoms. Again, it's important to get it checked out. The virus can enter the body through broken skin. So skin to skin contact. Um, it can also be through close um, respiratory um, droplets. So um, kissing, bodily contact, sex, um, even can um, spread the, the um, the virus um, to someone else. But I wanna also say again, it's really rare. Um, this disease is really rare and it is a, it's difficult to spread person to person unless you're having prolonged skin contact um, with another individual. There have been cases reported of direct contact with body fluids or lesion material. So also being careful about handling um, bed sheets or linens um, that someone who has monkeypox or, or a suspected rash um, of monkeypox or similar, um, then handling those materials without appropriate gloves um, or appropriate um, protective equipment um, can also uh, lead to transmission of monkeypox. 
There have been cases reported of animal to human transmission. We know about cases of um, children having pets like such as prairie dogs, um, with the prairie dogs being infected and um, children um, uh, developing infections that way as well. Also through um, an infected animal um, with bites or scratch to a human being. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to reiterate that if you develop a rash, like something that I've shown you, or symptoms of that, that you're suspicious of monkeypox, within 21 days of the onset of that illness, we would consider post-exposure prophylaxis or providing you with treatment um, to prevent a uh, uh, further development of monkeypox. So if you have the rash and you report having contact with somebody who's had a similar appearing rash or who was told that they have a probable or confirmed case of monkeypox, then that would be consideration for post-exposure prophylaxis. If you develop a rash or symptoms within 21 days and you've had close or intimate in-person contact with individuals in a social network um, experience, like you attended a festival together and someone in that group had monkeypox. Um, this would also include many of sex with men um, or, or um, meeting partners through online um, uh, uh, dating sites or online websites or a social event like a party, festivals, bars. Um, but if you develop the rash and have this contact, um, then we also may consider post-exposure prophylaxis. And that's because there have been cases reported of individuals who um, were um, in, a, in a festival or in a group setting um, and an individual developed monkeypox. So they may not have known that they had the exposure, but they had um, uh, close contact with a network of friends in which it may have been discovered later that someone may have been exposed. So that, that's the reasoning for that. Um, for that criteria. Another criteria I showed you the map of, um, of countries that have monkeypox. So if you've developed symptoms and you would travel to a country um, that is having an outbreak or has had a case of monkeypox, and that also may be um, consideration for post-exposure prophylaxis. And then also if you develop symptoms and you had contact with a dead or live animal or exotic pet, um, and that is um, of an African endemic species or product derived from such animals like eating game meat, creams, lotions, um, then you can also uh, be considered for post-exposure prophylaxis if you've developed symptoms. Next slide, please. So if you suspect that you have been exposed or someone has told you that they have confirmed or possible monkeypox, it's really important that you isolate immediately from others because we don't want you or any other individuals around you um, to become ill. And then call your doctor or your healthcare system um, in order to be checked out. Your doctor um, or healthcare provider may swab your rash if you have a rash um, and send that to the county public health lab for testing so that the um, monkeypox can be confirmed. Next slide, please. So I just wanna go over post-exposure prophylaxis. So I just showed you some of the criteria that are actually laid out by the CDC. So if you're ill and within those 21 days, you also were told that you um, were in contact with someone with monkeypox, you attended an event where someone um, developed monkeypox, you were in contact with, an, um, uh, with, um, with having game meat or an animal that might've been infected with monkeypox. Um, if we consider that uh, um, a high risk exposure then, or an intermediate risk exposure, we would consider giving you post-exposure prophylaxis. So this is actually a vaccine, the Genios vaccine, and it can be given um, four days from the date of exposure. So this is why it's really important to pay attention to your body, um, check your body out to make sure you haven't developed any rashes or pimples or any other um, sites of concern um, and, and making sure that you get into your healthcare provider in a timely manner to get checked out. Um, if given between four to 14 days after the date of exposure, the vaccine may reduce the symptoms of disease, but it may not prevent the disease from uh, happening. And this is managed by the local health department. So your provider will reach out to our local health department um, and then we will be able to facilitate giving that vaccine. Um, and I just wanna stress here that we have um, given individuals the Genius vaccine to prevent them from developing monkeypox here in San Diego. Next slide, please. 
For pre-exposure prophylaxis, this is coming soon. It will be geared towards high-risk groups. Um, there is a national strategy outline that has been developed, and we are waiting to receive vaccine. So I just want to put that out there, that there will be more information coming out on pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, however, um, we don't have this as of yet, but we are preparing for pre-exposure prophylaxis with the Genius vaccine. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this vaccine, um, which is given for post-exposure prophylaxis and then potentially for um, pre-exposure prophylaxis. It is a live virus vaccine, but it does not cause monkeypox. Um, it causes an immune response um, so that it can prevent, so that you develop immunity from um, developing monkeypox, or um, it also is effective against smallpox. Um, it's indicated for the prevention of smallpox and monkeypox in 18-year-old um, adults, basically 18 and older. So this is not a vaccine that we give to children. It is an injection um, and it's a single dose. We give a second dose 28 days later um, or four weeks apart. Next slide, please. We'll go back, yep. Yeah. So prevention, obviously, if you are ill or feel um, that or you've developed a rash, we do want you to isolate yourself um, from others. If you've been told that you have a known exposure, it's important to isolate and call your physician or your healthcare provider. Avoid contact with any materials that such as bedding um, or linens of an individual that may have had um, suspected or confirmed um, monkeypox, or if you see a rash, um, um, and you're not sure, it's best to avoid um, touching that bedding or that um, or linens um, that were used by the individual. The best thing you can do is practice good hand hygiene. Make sure that you're washing your hands with soap and water or using hand sanitizer um, to keep yourself healthy. Um, and especially if you are, have been around somebody that is suspected or confirmed um, to have monkeypox. For healthcare providers, we're asking that you do use um, PPE or personal protective equipment. And this would include gown, gloves, um, uh, goggles, or um, I'm. Um, uh, eyewear, um, protective eyewear, um, and um, uh, gowns and mask, a surgical mask. Next slide, please. Um, and this, if we do have a website set up um, by the County of San Diego for more information about monkeypox. This is updated along with our case counts, um, situational updates, and any other information that you need, um, as well as contact information. Next slide, please. I think that's the end. I welcome any questions and I wanna wish you all a very happy pride. And Dr. Kadakia, there are two questions in the Q&A. So we're actually gonna thank you so much. We're okay. actually gonna do the next presentation first and then we'll do all the questions for the entire panel. So, so thank you so much, Dr. Kadakia. Uh, and just as a reminder to everyone on the call, if you do have questions, please do put them into the Q&A box. Um, and then we will get to them after our next presentation. So uh, our next speaker is Dr. Eric C. McDonald, who is the Chief Medical Officer of the Medical Care Services Division, County of San Diego Health and Human Services Agency. He earned a BA from Williams College in 1981 and received his MD from the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences in 1985. He completed residency programs in emergency medicine at Naval Medical Center San Diego and in preventive medicine and public health at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. McDonald, Eric, served 20 years. Patrick, um, you have frozen on the screen for us. Um, so I will go ahead and assist um, finishing up um, Dr. McDonald's bio. You're back. Do you want to take it back up? Sure. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. So sorry about that. And thank you for letting me know. Um, so where in the bio did I break off? And I'll just pick up from there. I'll start from the beginning again, I guess. You broke off in the bio when you were talking about um, 
uh, the uniform services um, Great. section. So he received his MD from the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences in 1985. He completed residency programs in emergency medicine at the Naval Medical Center San Diego and in preventive medicine and public health at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. McDonald, Eric, served 24 years on active duty in the United States Navy and has worked at the County of San Diego since 2010. He has lived in the Mission Hills neighborhood in San Diego with his husband, Brian Yaw, since 1998. Dr. McDonald, Eric, welcome, and I'll pass it off to you. Uh, thanks, Patrick, and uh, uh, I appreciate that introduction, and I also appreciate the opportunity to, 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 to speak about uh, invasive meningococcal disease, and every, I want to start off by um, uh, reiterating that I really appreciated, and um, it was a very heartfelt introduction that you gave that resonated with me personally, and I just wanted to thank you for that, and uh, I'm glad I could uh, talk about this with, uh, with our community here. Uh, thanks for the introductory slide, though. You can go to the next one. You know, even though I'm the chief medical officer uh, for the county, uh, I'm an emergency medicine doctor by heart, and I always like to have the bottom line up front, and just in one sentence, what do I need to know? And what, I, what, what you all need to know is that meningococcal disease or invasive meningococcal disease is a rare but potentially fatal illness that is treatable with best results the earlier it's diagnosed, which is why people need to know the symptoms, uh, and also preventable with good hygiene and vaccination. So that's, that's my bottom line up front. Uh, next slide, please. So what uh, causes uh, invasive meningococcal disease? It's a bacteria called Neisseria meningitidis. Uh, it's a bacteria that has uh, six uh, uh, serogroups or um, subfamilies, I guess, that have um, uh, caused disease worldwide. Uh, groups B, C, and Y cause the most disease in the United States. This is a bacteria that really only lives in humans. And most of the time it, it happily coexists with us. That is, it lives in the mouth and nose areas of, of most people. About one in 10 adults actually will have uh, the bacteria found uh, in those sites at, at any uh, particular time. Uh, and it just lives there uh, uh, happily like other bacteria on the surface of our skin and in our, in our mouths. But a very small number of bad bugs uh, can become invasive. That is, get into our system and uh, cause a disease in normally sterile areas. And that's really what invasive meningococcal disease is. Uh, it, it, and it, and this, these bad bugs usually will cause disease when it enters someone's body and has been a new inhabitant in their mouth and nose for uh, uh, the first few days. And why some people get it versus others, why certain bad bugs exist when others aren't invasive is really not known. It's partially that there's some bad bugs that have specific attributes that make them more likely to be invasive. And there are certain people that are more likely to have uh, invasion occur. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Next slide. Um, invasive meningococcal disease has two common outcomes. One of them is called meningitis and the other is a bloodstream infection. And it gets hard when you're talking about this because you're talking about meningococcal meningitis and that gets mixed up with other forms of meningitis, and I'm hoping I can keep the terms straight here by, by talking about it. Um, these infections, these invasive diseases, usually appear three to seven days after being exposed to the bacteria, uh, and both conditions can be very serious and deadly. In fact, uh, we in medical school have uh, uh, stories of, of and, and, I've, and I have personal experience of individuals who are happy, healthy, with literally no symptoms, and then unfortunately dead from this invasive disease within 24 hours. It's remarkable how quickly uh, symptoms to pro can progress. And again, one of my take home messages is if you have these early symptoms, it's very important to go uh, seek care quickly so that you can be evaluated to make sure this is not what you have. Um, people recover from meningococcal disease uh, if they're treated early, but they can have lifelong complications such as loss of limbs, deafness, nervous system uh, problems or, or brain damage. I'm gonna talk about each of these two types of disease now. Next slide. Meningococcal meningitis is a, a form of meningitis, which is a infection or inflammation of the tissue that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. Meningitis can be caused by many things, viruses, bacteria, autoimmune diseases, 
but meningococcal bacteria are one of the potential causes. Uh, the symptoms of meningococcal meningitis include the sudden onset of fever, headache, and stiff neck. That's the classic triad. And there may be additional symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, photophobia, which is sensitivity to light, hyperacusis, which is sensitivity to loud sounds, and confusion and altered mental status. Next slide. The other uh, manifestation is something called a bloodstream infection. And that's when the bacteria enter the blood, multiply, and then damage the walls of the blood vessels causing microscopic and sometimes even more bleeding into the skin and the organs throughout the body. The symptoms may include fever or cold chills, uh, a sense of fatigue, uh, being tired, uh, vomiting or diarrhea, uh, cold hands and feet, uh, severe aches and pains in the muscles, joints, chest, or abdomen, uh, rapid breathing. And it, uh, what's characteristic about this infection is a dark purple rash. And I'll show you some pictures in a moment. And you can unfortunately have both meningitis, that first thing I talked about, and a bloodstream infection at the same time. So all of these symptoms could be combined or some combination of what I've talked about would prompt one to think that you could have invasive meningococcal disease. Next slide. This is a picture of the rash. And uh, I'm, uh, on my screen, this is looking like these little dots uh, and, and, and rash marks are a little pinkish to, to reddish. Um, the little tiny uh, dots, which are, are called petechiae, they're about the size of a pinhead. And they can start off being red or pink, but they usually rapidly progress to become more purple in color. And when they are larger, uh, they're called purpura. Uh, I'm going to show you the next slide, which I think shows you uh, a little bit more of that purple color. And the reason that there's a glass uh, being pressed against this person's skin is that there are lots of rashes that cause little red bumps, okay, or little red spots. Uh, but when you push on them, they go away and they'll come back and be red after you pushed on it. This is glass being pushed on that rash and it's not going away. And that's the characteristic of this little uh, uh, or larger purple rash. If you have a rash that suddenly appears with fever and doesn't go away when you push on it, that is a reason to go and be evaluated immediately uh, uh, by uh, an emergency department. Next slide. Uh, certain people are at higher risk for developing invasive meningococcal disease. Uh, babies, teenagers, and young adults have higher rates of this disease than other people uh, do. Uh, people living with HIV are at increased risk and having a low CD4 count or high viral load increases your risk further. So even if you have HIV that's well controlled, that actually puts you at higher risk uh, than uh, individuals who are not living with HIV. Other factors such as uh, having certain medical conditions, traveling to certain countries uh, in Africa, for example, uh, living in congregate sittings, especially amongst a lot of people you don't know very well or have recently come together, uh, such as a, 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 a freshman dorm on a college campus, uh, increases your risk for getting this disease no matter your age. And what you should do is if you have one of the things I've talked about, it's important that you talk to your healthcare professional to see if you're at increased risk and need to get vaccinated. Next slide. How is this spread? Well, you know, I told you it lived in, in a lot of people's mouths and nose and it's spread from person to person through the mouth and nose and the secretions that come uh, from them. So you, it can be uh, through respiratory uh, uh, means, but primarily direct contact with respiratory and throat secretions such as saliva and spit, or really just very close um, uh, coughing, uh, kissing would be a good uh, way to transmit it. Um, lengthy contact of living in the same household means that you've exposed probably to enough aerosolized um, secretions that you may be exposed. The good news is that this bacteria is much harder to spread than viruses that cause the common cold or the flu or even COVID, which I think we're very familiar with how that has been uh, uh, causing uh, increasing disease in our community. If you're taking precautions to prevent COVID or the flu or other respiratory diseases, you're doing exactly what you need to do to protect yourself against meningococcal disease. So if you're uh, masking uh, in certain situations, maintaining social distancing, um, if you're um, not sharing food and drink with people, if you're not sharing smoking utensils uh, or cigarettes, 
uh, then uh, those are things that can help you basically not swap spit, okay, <laughs> or saliva with people. That's really how this is transmitted from person to person. Next slide. Uh, the incubation period and how long it takes from exposure to uh, illness is, again, you, anywhere between two and four, uh, 10 days, but usually four. It can be co communicated to others a, a full seven days before people become sick, which is, again, a, a concern. And especially for us in the health department, when we diagnose somebody, we do a contact investigation and often will uh, identify a lot of people who need to have preventive treatment given to them. The cases require antibiotic treatment as soon as possible. Uh, because any delay, even minutes to hours, can uh, lead to a worse outcome. And the people who are contacted need to be given antibiotics to prevent disease within 24 hours. I can tell you that as a practicing emergency doctor, uh, we were uh, always told that if you had a patient that you thought had this disease, they need to have antibiotics in their system within 24 hours of hitting the door. That's how fast it, and important it was for us to get antibiotics into uh, folks to prevent bad outcomes from this disease. Next slide. So why are we talking about it? Well, because there are some outbreaks in Florida in the uh, um, gay, bisexual, uh, MSM community. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, as of this morning, there were uh, 31 cases so far this year uh, with seven deaths. Uh, many of these cases are uh, individuals who are living with HIV and most of the cases are uh, Hispanic, actually. Uh, there's also another separate outbreak in another part of Florida, a very specific part of Florida that's among college and university students. It's actually a different strain of meningococcus, but again, goes to show that it's specific communities, once it's introduced, that can cause um, uh, uh, concern about this uh, uh, bacteria. So the CDC and the Florida Health Department are recommending that gay and bisexual men consider getting vaccinated or boosted with one of the available uh, what's called quadrivalent vaccines to prevent disease. The disease that's causing the outbreak in Florida is group C, and it's in, it's covered by the quadrivalent or ACY uh, vaccine. Uh, for those of you who've been in Southern California for a while, we had a very similar outbreak uh, caused by group C bacteria in Southern California uh, among um, gay, bisexual, uh, and other men who have sex with men. Um, we didn't have any cases in San Diego, but there were 18 cases total in the Southern California counties, including uh, four deaths. And uh, we're giving the same advice now that we did then. And uh, a health advice advisory was issued um, uh, just a couple weeks ago, and I'm going to go over that in the next slide. Uh, basically, any all persons living with HIV should have a, a basic series of the quadrivalent or ACWY vaccine. The trade names are listed there, Menevo and Menactra. Uh, they, everyone should have that. If, you haven't, if, you have, if you're living with HIV and you haven't had that, that's something you should do right now. Um, and then secondly, all men who have sex with men, bisexual uh, and gay men, regardless of HIV uh, serous status, should receive uh, at least one dose of the um, quadrivalent or ACWY vaccine. Uh, and if you were somebody who got the vaccine uh, uh, in the last uh, outbreak in Southern California, that was um, uh, about six, seven years ago. And uh, unfortunately, it's a vaccine that sort of reduces effectiveness over time. And so if you got one then, I would recommend that you get a booster now. Uh, it's really anybody who's more than five years from their past do dose and is in one of these risk groups, and uh, MSM are the primary risk group, um, should, should get the vaccine now. And then you can take, again, the steps that I talked about that are the non-pharmacologic interventions, not sharing drinks, cigarettes, et cetera. Um, and then just be aware that, uh, you know, while condoms uh, protect against sexually transmitted diseases, it doesn't really reduce the risk of meningococcal disease because, again, if you think about how it's transmitted. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a little bit more information about the vaccines. Uh, again, uh, don't get these confused. The quadrivalent or ACWY vaccine is the one we're recommending for uh, 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 currently because of this outbreak in Florida. Uh, and um, uh, uh, the meningococcal B vaccine is the one that would be uh, used uh, in young adults to prevent, say, uh, college outbreaks. And those of you who remember the outbreak that we had at San Diego State back uh, 
I guess, coming up on four years ago, that was uh, meningococcal B, and that's a different vaccine. So if you actually had that one uh, and you uh, uh, are at, at risk from, uh, as I've described, you really need to go back and get the quadrivalent vaccine because that other vaccine is not going to protect you. Next slide. So in summary, uh, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, especially those living with HIV, should always be aware of occasional outbreaks in our community. Um, and uh, you know, if you're going to Florida, have friends coming in uh, from Florida for Pride, uh, or if you just want to uh, uh, be uh, safest, uh, especially people who are living with HIV, I would recommend that you get the vaccine. Um, uh, if you have any of the symptoms I've described, it's a reason to go to an emergency room immediately. Actually, I want to reassure you, most of the time, you're not going to end up having this. You're going to be evaluated. It's going to be some other virus, and that's okay. You just don't want to be somebody who sits on this saying, I, I don't know, wait till I get worse before I go in. That's too long for this disease. Uh, again, the point I made about reducing risk for sexually transmitted diseases is not the same as reducing risk for meningococcal disease. And if doing all the things you've heard about for the last two years to reduce your chances of COVID, those are the things you should do to prevent um, meningococcal disease. Know your HIV status. The problem is that during the last two years of COVID, uh, people have not been going out and checking themselves the way they had before, both because of just access to care and, well, we've been worried about COVID. So uh, it's important to know your status. And if you really uh, are sexually active and don't know your status, now is the time to get tested because it might be that, that uh, you have uh, uh, HIV and you might need this vaccine and you might need to be started uh, on a treatment for HIV. And I'll let Patrick elaborate on that. Please reduce your risk of getting vaccinated per the current guidelines using this vaccine. You can go to a, your own provider because our health officer has made this recommendation. It is covered by your insurance uh, as a recommendation. Uh, or we're going to talk about county resources later that can be utilized. And I think that's my last slide. So, uh, and then we'll be ready for questions. Yep, that's it. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, and just to follow up on what you just talked about um, uh, and how you did post this in the chat box, uh, the County Health and Human Services Agency will be providing free vaccine for invasive meningococcal disease at the San Diego LGBT Community Center this Sunday and next Sunday uh, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. So if you're headed to the farmer's market, just head over to 3909 Center Street, just a block over for free vaccine. And a huge thank you to the San Diego LGBT Community Center for allowing us the space to provide these very important vaccines. And you can see on the screen there that we have posted um, a flyer advertising this. This is totally free. We really encourage everyone, if you are, have not had um, the vaccine recently, to come join, come see us. So we will now begin the question and answer session. We have assembled a panel to answer your questions, including both Drs. Kadakia and McDonald, whom we've already met, and they will be joined by Dr. Mark Beatty. Dr. Beatty is a pediatric and preventive medicine specialist and has an MPH from Johns Hopkins University. He served eight years in the U.S. Public Health Service after training, including two years in the Indian Health Service in Crown Point, New Mexico, and six Six years with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He focused on global health and vaccines for 10 years while at the International Vaccine Institute in Seoul, South Korea, and in the pharmaceutical industry. Dr. Beatty joined the San Diego County Health and Human Services Agency in December 2020 to address COVID-19 and support the Epidemiology and Immunization Services branch. Dr. Beatty started out as a cook, and in his free time, Dr. Beatty still enjoys cooking without using recipes. Welcome, Dr. Beatty. Uh, once again, let me please remind you to type your questions into the Q&A box, uh, and Heidi, I am, will be reading the questions from the Q&A to the panel. Heidi, what is our first question? Thanks, Patrick. So the first question, could you please discuss the concern of potential transmission through respiratory droplets and possibly airborne transmission per the WHO and British public health agencies. This has been reported by New York Times science reporter Apuvra Mandavili as recently as June 7th and June 10th. And this was posted during the monkeypox presentation. 
Um, I can start off and maybe Dr. McDonald or Dr. Beatty can step in as well. But um, so currently our Centers for Disease Control um, and Prevention are not reporting airborne transmission for monkeypox. Um, but I do want to just put in a little explanation there. The monkeypox virus are small particles. Um, and unlike tuberculosis, for instance, tuberculosis lingers in the air um, and can spread through air currents. And so with the monkeypox virus um, particles, they're reporting that the virus drops out of the air um, uh, um, more quickly. Um, and hence, it's thought to be really the respiratory droplets, and which is why the surgical mask um, was recommended versus um, an airborne precaution mask, which would be like an N95 respirator. And so for this particular illness, we're recommending a surgical mask um, to avoid those respiratory droplets if you are near someone um, with suspected or confirmed um, monkeypox. And I don't know if Dr. Beatty or Dr. McDonald have anything further to add? Uh, this is Mark. Yeah, I, I'll add that, um, and thank you so much. CDC on their website mentions that in terms of respiratory precaution, they're saying three hours of face-to-face -face contact, which is a long time. Um, I think it's really hard to separate out how this particular virus um, gets transmitted through droplets because a lot of the time there are other ways that it's being transmitted, particularly through um, direct contact with skin at the same time. So they're having different methods of being exposed to virus. But I will say to date, CDC has been following people who have been exposed on fl airline flights, so sitting on flights for hours at a time, next to a case um, that was infectious and there hasn't been no transmission um, at all. So it, it, while it is recognized that it's possible, it seems much more difficult to transmit the virus through respiratory droplets. It's clearly not like COVID, but wearing the mask will definitely help, especially when you know occasionally people are talking may accidentally spit and fluid could hit a, a mucous membrane or something like that. And that could certainly be another way that the virus can be transmitted. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kadakia and Dr. Beatty. Um, Dr. McDonald, um, I'm, I'm thinking that question's pretty well covered, but if you have anything else. No, I'm good. All right. Um, the next question. So the title was Prepping for Pride. We heard a lot of information here today, but nobody really addressed prepping for pride. How do we prep for pride? I can start with that in particular for monkeypox. And, and I think the same, um, of course, could be true for men invasive meningococcal disease as well. But again, feel free to jump in um, for the other doctors. Um, so really, when we're talking about prepping for pride, um, what we mean is if you feel ill or you have symptoms like you've had some swollen glands and a fever, or you've got a cough, or you aren't feeling well, um, or you develop a rash, we would suggest that you stay home um, and avoid any events where um, you may become ill or have um, be able to spread infection to others. So if you suspect, um, if you develop fever, have swollen glands, you don't feel well, you develop a rash, we would um, ask you to stay home from pride events and call your physician or your health care provider as soon as you can um, to be seen and get checked out. Um, so that's one way um, to prep for pride. The other way we want to um, suggest that you prep for pride is also speak with your partners, get to know um, who you might be having intimate contact with, um, and just find out, you know, have they been ill recently? Is there any concern or anything that you want to know? Because you're, you're sharing um, a space with them in close proximity. So those are some of the ways to keep safe. And then, of course, I think some of the same techniques that we used for COVID um, also apply here, like good hand hygiene um, taking a bottle of hand sanitizer in your pocket, um, maybe when you're walking in the pride um, parade, you know, just making sure that you're um, cleaning your hands frequently, covering up a cough if you've got one, and just the basic ways that we would want you to stay safe um, um, when you are out in a large um, group or socializing with others. I don't know if Dr. Beatty or Dr. McDonald had anything else to add. No, I thought I thought it was a great answer. I think that you know, for me, information is power, and uh, really, what we're trying to do is give you the best information about you know potential communicable disease, 
risks that uh, over and above the one we've been hearing about for the last two and a half years uh, that might change, uh, you know, some of the activities that you uh, decide to engage in um, uh, over pride. Uh, I think that, uh, again, I, I'd like to just maybe call out that that many members of our community have different um, uh, levels of uh, concern and uh, uh, um, uh, react differently uh, given the information that they that, that, that we've just provided. Obviously, we provide a lot of information about COVID. COVID is increasing in the community, and I think it's going to get getting worse as the next couple of weeks go by. Something to be aware of. Um, and you know, people have already, I think, factored that in to what they plan to do for for Pride. But here are now two more things, just again, to factor in to just you know weigh your own personal situation and what you want to do over this wonderful weekend that we have coming up. Uh, and uh, again, knowledge lets you make the decisions for yourself. Uh, and just also recognize diversity in our community doesn't mean um, maybe the first couple levers, layers of diversity that we often think of. Another level of diversity is people just have different concerns and attitudes about communicable diseases in public environments. And I think that if one person is choosing to wear a mask outside, um, you know, I wouldn't make any presuppositions or um, uh, assumptions about why someone's doing that. It may be for many, many different reasons. And I think that's one of the, frankly, the joys of our community is that we accept that and that we, you know, let people have this diversity as we're enjoying this great weekend. Those, those would be my comments. Uh, Dr. Beatty, do you, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, 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 I think that's pretty well covered. Thank you. Oh, and um, maybe the meningococcal vaccine is a great way to prep for Pride if you haven't already received it. Absolutely. Okay. Um, another question that came in that was answered by Dr. Kadakia um, in, um, in the Q&A, but we'll go ahead and open this up. Can you elaborate on treatment plan? Um, for example, PEP regimen, days of treatment, et cetera. Is it the same as PEP for HIV exposure? It would help to clarify for community the difference from PEP for HIV versus PEP for monkeypox. Yeah, that's a great question because I know we use that same terminology, but when we're talking about PEP, which stands for post-exposure prophylaxis, so it's somebody who has been exposed or in contact with somebody who has the illness, um, we would, and the illness could be monkeypox in the situation that we're talking about, monkeypox, but we do have what we call PEP for HIV, and that's separate. So PEP for HIV, we use medications, tablets um, that we use to treat HIV um, that we would give to an individual who has um, who has been exposed. For monkeypox, we're using a vaccine, Genios, um, which we give one vaccine, um, hopefully within four days of exposure to an individual um, who may um, who may have symptoms or who have been who has been in contact with somebody who had um, who has been uh, suspected or confirmed to have monkeypox, um, and then we give a second dose of that same vaccine 28 days later. And that's in the hopes of preventing someone from developing monkeypox. So this is a vaccine for monkeypox that we're using for post-exposure prophylaxis versus pills that we use um, in HIV to prevent um, someone from developing HIV after an exposure. Thank you, Dr. Kadakia. I'm wondering, Dr. Beatty, if you'd like to answer um, the next question. Um, can you please reshare any monkeypox vaccination information um, about events? Um, and we didn't post any, um, but we'll let Dr. Beatty um, respond to um, the, the monkeypox vaccination. You're on mute. I, I hate when I do that. Um, so sorry. So at the current time, the amount of vaccine that's available in the entire U.S. is is limited. One of the things that CDC does as our public health agency is to create a national stockpile of treatments for specific diseases, and the one for that can be used for monkeypox is actually. Um, the same as smallpox. It's it's the vaccine that we were discussing, and there are actually two. 
But um, right now, there is not enough vaccine to be used um, widely, other than if somebody has been exposed and could potentially develop disease. So if you've had um, exposure to a case, then PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, the vaccine is being made available for that uh, use. As the vaccine increases the amount that's available to, um, to be distributed throughout the US, plans will start to get launched. And I believe yesterday, um, the Health and Human Services Agency announced the pre-exposure prophylaxis plan using the Genios vaccine. So that even, even if you haven't been, you know, like an event like this where you you could potentially have an, an unwitting exposure to get event, uh, vaccinated in advance, that will start to become an option. So we're planning to do that as the vaccine becomes more widely available. But right now, we're largely focusing on post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, the only other thing I will mention, though, that if you have for some reason for example, people who have been in the military, you may have received a smallpox uh, vaccination. And if that has been, um, if you received that greater than three years uh, ago, you would still need a booster, a single shot, not the two doses of the Genios. So just a reminder that you may have some protection if you were recently in the military and got, received that vaccination. Thanks. Thank you. Um, there's another question, and I'm not sure um, if this ans if you answered that question um, with your previous answer. Um, uh, can you tell us anything more about pre-exposure plans to protect against monkeypox? And Adam, you posed that question. Just wondering if um, Dr. Beatty's um, previous answer um, covered that for you. Um, if not, please feel free to. Um, uh, note in the, in the Q&A that you have an additional question about that. Okay, that is everything that came in um, through the question and answer. Um, we still have a few more minutes if anybody has additional questions. Um, I also posted some information um, in the chat, um, a couple of URLs. I'm sorry that the spacing came out funky, um, but there's a URL for the County of San Diego's um, monkeypox site um, that has um, additional information. And then there is also a link um, for um, information about meningococcal disease. Um, so please uh, feel free to um, go ahead and take a look at those resources um, and we'll move on. Patrick, I'll send it back to you. Thank you so much, Heidi. Uh, as I stated at the beginning, we will be posting video of this town hall to uh, our website. Um, so if you want to rewatch something or if you have uh, friends or colleagues who didn't have a chance to attend, please direct them to this. Uh, and just want to remind everybody again that we will, we will be holding two free vaccine events for invasive meningococcal disease at the center this Sunday and next from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, and I just want to extend a huge thank you to all of our panelists with us uh, this evening, uh, Dr. Kadakia, Dr. McDonald, Dr. Beatty, thank you so much for being here. And I want to extend a huge thank you to all of the county staff who made this uh, town hall uh, possible. And finally, I just want to say thank you to everyone who took time out of your day to show up for this very important event. On behalf of all of us here at the county, uh, I wish you an amazing and safe Pride weekend. Thank you so much, everybody.